Howdy class! The following is your chain rule lecture from section 15.6. Before we begin, how about I just remind you of what the chain rule is back in one variable. So I know you probably know because you've probably used it many times, but let me write it again anyway. So recall that in uh, one variable or one dimension, if we have some function and we stick some other function inside of it, this is what's known as function composition. Okay, and uh, if I, let's say, name a third function, h of x defined as the composition of f and g, uh, I can also write, here's another notation which you might occasionally see, h is equal to f composed with g. Yeah, the little circle means composed with. So that's just notation right there. And what the chain rule states is that h prime of x is, well, you take the derivative of the function on the outside and follow it up by the derivative of the function on the inside. So we get a f prime and then followed up by a g prime. And one thing that you should not forget is f prime is being evaluated at g of x. All right, so there's your one variable chain rule. Now let's move on to two or more variables and a warning about notation. So I started doing this in the last section and we are going to continue to not really distinguish between points and vectors. So boldface R of T traditionally denotes the vector who's with components say X of T and Y of T, but we will also use it to denote the point whose coordinates are x of t and y of t. In the last section, I also gave you the chain rule for paths. And this is the one where I talked about a, an ant who went on a walk across a frying pan and he carried a thermometer in his pocket. Um, oh. Wait, ants don't have pockets. Sorry, he carried a thermometer in his backpack. And uh, you could keep track of the rate of change of the reading on the thermometer as a function of time, because the thermometer reading depended on the position, and the position of the ant was varying in time. So that was one case where we, wanted, where we needed a chain rule property that was a chain in that case, it was the chain rule for paths. Later on in this lecture, you'll see how to do it for when even more variables are involved. Um, for example, we might need a chain rule for when x and y both depend on r and theta, as in the case of polar coordinates. But uh, here was the chain rule for paths formula, which, like I said, you've already seen it, but I will write it here again. So that's when f is a scalar valued function of let's say n variables x1 through xn, r is a vector valued function of one variable time t. In that case, we can find the time derivative of the composite function f of r of t. And what we saw, the formula given, was that it's the gradient of the function on the outside dotted with the velocity vector, if you will, or the time derivative of the vector valued function on the inside. And again, like I mentioned, don't forget to evaluate the function on the outside at the point in question, which is at r of t. Now, I didn't prove this formula when I gave it to you, and I'm not super inclined to prove it now because the proof is kind of technical and maybe a bit hard for this class, but I'll give you a little pseudo proof, maybe a mini proof using differentials. So here's a pseudo proof. If f 
is a function of x and y, then we saw that df, the change in f for a change in x and y, is equal to partial f, partial x dx, and partial f, partial y dy. OK, but if x is a function of time, now suppose that time changes by an amount dt, then we find that dx is dx dt times dt. Similarly, uh, for y, we find that Uh, if y is y of t, then for a change in t dt, we get a change dy in y equal to dy dt dt. OK, putting this together then, the change in f, which was partial f, partial x, dx. But what's dx? Let's replace dx by um, dx dt dt. So I find that df is partial f partial x times dx dt dt. And similarly, for the second term, that will be partial f partial y dy dt times dt. Thus, we have found what the change in f is for a small change in t. You can then divide everything by dt, say, to find that the, that the rate of change of this function with respect to time is partial f partial x dx dt plus partial f partial y dy dt. Cool. OK, so um, that is just the same formula as that one. Well, in this case, when there's just x and y variables. Oh, and notice what I wrote here, df dt. Mm. Um, technically, that might be bad notation. So technically, what I maybe should have written to be more precise is d dt of f of x of t, y of t. But what I'm saying here in this note about notation is that when there's no possibility of confusion, we, we will just write this as df dt. It'll save a lot of space. OK. So let's do an example. How about if f depends on three variables, x, y, and z, and it's equal to x, y squared plus z, and we're evaluating it along the path t, t squared, t cubed. OK, then if we want to plug in that formula, we'll need to compute some derivatives. So the formula we're trying to plug in is this one right here. We will need that the gradient of f is apparently y squared 2xy 1. We will need that r prime of t is 1, 2t, and 3t squared. We will need to evaluate the gradient at r of t. So that means I'm going to take this expression and plug in for x, for y, and for z to get, let's see, y squared is t to the fourth. Um, 2xy is 
times t times t squared. Then the gradient of f evaluated at r of t dotted with r prime of t is t to the fourth, 2t cubed, 1 dotted with 1, 2t, 3t squared, giving me 4t to the fourth plus, sorry, giving me t to the fourth plus 4, t to the fourth plus 3t squared, or 5t to the fourth plus 3t squared. And there, that's our partial derivative. Or excuse me, that, that's, our, um, that's our rate of change of f of r of t. For exa and for example, if maybe you were interested in the rate of change of f of r of t at some particular time, well, then you would just plug in that particular time to say, find how fast this function is changing at t equals 17 or whatever time you're interested in. But while I'm here, let me show you that there's a alternate way you could have done this by just directly composing the functions. So if I computed oops, f of r of t before taking the derivative, I would get, well, we need to plug in for x, y, and z in the function for, in the formula for f, that would give me t times t squared squared plus t cubed, which is t to the fifth plus t cubed. Then from that, we can just take the time derivative pretty easily. So d dt of f of r of t will equal 5t to the fourth plus 3t squared. Same thing, of course, but obtained by doing steps in a different order. This sort of verifies the formula, though. So of course, you should get the same thing. And even though it looked like this method, too, might have been a bit easier, um, in this case it was. In other cases, you might definitely need to use the formula, especially when it gets complicated. OK, so having settled that, let's make things more complicated now. What we just did was the chain rule for paths in which, uh, where there was only one independent variable, t, for time. What if there's more than one independent variable? Like, how about two independent variables? So what if f is a function of x and y, but x and y are both functions of s and t? OK, well. If we want the, to compute the partial derivative, um, let's say with respect to t of what we're looking at now is we're trying to find d dt of f of x, but x depends on s and t, and y, but y also depends on s and t. Okay, and remember, we will sometimes just um, write this in shorthand as df dt. So, because when you take partial derivatives, you hold the other variable fixed, we can actually just use the same chain rule, uh, this, the same chain rule for paths formula that we already just talked about. Um, the only difference is instead of writing some d's, we're going to have to write the curly partial d symbol. But 
the formula looks pretty similar and the reason is the reason is because when you take a partial derivative you hold the other variable fixed so the single variable rule still applies if I let's say like take this formula and change all the d's to partials I get the partial derivative of f with respect to t and it's right there so I don't know do you want me to explain that further or not wish need more like interactivity when I film these videos. I don't know, like, do, do you want me to show you why that is? I can do a brief little proof here, and then if you don't care why it is, you can just skip over the next couple minutes. But here's why. Um, let's see, if, if we want, let's say, partial, let's say we want partial f partial t at some point, uh, say evaluated at st equals, let's say, a, b. Um, well, this is the same as d dt of f of x of, let's see, s is a, a, t, y of a, comma, T. And then you evaluate, it th evaluate this at t equals b. So thus, that's why I'm saying you can just use the uh, chain rule for paths formula that we already derived or more or less derived in order to get uh, this partial derivative. Right, because then this would equal... Um, Ah, I don't, should I show it? Okay, here, I'll show it because, so then this would equal uh, partial f dx uh, times d dt of x of a t plus partial f partial y times d dt of y of a t and then all of this evaluated at t equals b. But um, this term right here, when we evaluate at t equals b, that's the same as partial x partial t here at, at t equals b. It's the same as df dx um, dx dt evaluated at um, st equals a b plus df dy dy dt evaluated at st equals a b. So um, that is how we get the partial derivative formula here. And similarly, we can now sort of try and complicate the picture a little bit more by supposing we have a function of three variables, x, y, and z. Each of x, y, and z depend on two variables. How about s and t? Um, in this case, By analogy with the situation above, we will now have to add on a third df dz dz dt term. There's a way to sort of visualize this to help you remember it. So you suppose you're interested in taking f. f depends on say x, y, and z x, y, and z each depend on s and t. All right, so like f depends on x, y, and z. x depends on s and t. y depends on s and t. and z depends on s on and 
t. Now, if you're interested in the partial derivative of f with respect to t, you have to um, go to t in every possible path, which means um, go from f to x and x to t. That's like df dx and then dx dt. But then you could also travel from f from f to y and from y to t. That's like taking a df dy term followed up by a dy dt term. And then finally, you could also get from f to t by going from f to z and from z to t. That's where we get df dz and dz dt. So um, multiplying and adding up all these terms, you get this expression. It's all the different paths you could take uh, to find the dependence of f on t. Similarly, you could find df ds, right? So here, if you're interested, if, you know, you should try and write this yourself. It's a, it's a good practice. See if you can. I'll give you a second, and then I'll just tell you what it is. One second. There, that was one second. So here's what it is. Partial f, partial s. Well, then, let's see. df dx, dx ds, plus df dy, dy ds, plus df dz, dz, ds. And that corresponds to first going on that path, and then going on that path, and then going on that path. Cool. So I think hopefully maybe now you've seen enough examples that you could imagine what the general chain rule would look like. This is where you have an outer function of an arbitrary number of variables and each of those depends on some arbitrary number of independent variables. So let's say f depends on n variables, x1 through xn. Each one of those depends on m independent variables, t1 through tn. OK. And in that case, we have the general chain rule for the derivative of the outer function with respect to one of the inner independent variables, let's say um, with respect to t sub k, where k can be um, any number from 1 to m. So well, here's the formula. It'll be all possible paths if I try to draw the same diagram again, where let's say here's f, and then f depends on x1 and x2 all the way out to xn. And then each one of those depends on like a t1 and a tk and up to tm. Well, if you're trying to find the partial derivative of f with respect to tk, you can take the x1 path, you can take the x2 path, all the way up to the xn path. And there is a more compact way to write this formula for the partial derivative. You might recognize that it's a dot product where the first term is, again, the gradient. It's a gradient of f. And uh, you could write it with summation notation as well. Although I was thinking of maybe taking this term out. Yeah, I don't I don't think I need to write that term. I'm just gonna just gonna delete that term, if you don't mind. Bloop. There it is. Okay, cool. So there that looks a little bit simpler. And this might all look kind of intimidating until you just try and do some examples. So let's do an example. So how about f depends on x and y as such, sine x plus y squared x. x and y each depend on three variables, s, t, and u, with x being s, t, y being s plus u, t. Notice uh, I wrote x. It's a function of s, t, and u, and it doesn't even depend on u. So that's possible. That could very well happen. 
You can always have a function that depends trivially on some independent variable. Now, the gradient of f is, let's see, that's cosine of x plus y squared and 2yx. dx ds is t. Oh wait, I didn't say which um, which variable we want to take the partial derivative of. Let's find let's find out what partial f partial how about s is. So I will need for that dx ds, which is t, and dy ds which is 1. Then partial f, partial s will be the gradient of f evaluated, by the way, at the point where um, x, y, z is equal to s, t, s plus u, t, and then dotted with dx, ds dy ds. So I'm going to have to plug in for x and y in terms of s, t, and u to this gradient to get cosine of s, t plus s plus u, t squared 2 times s plus u, t times s, t dotted with, um, what was it, t1. So I get cos s t plus s plus u t squared times t plus 2 s plus u t times s t. Cool. OK, so um, there's df ds. I could also evaluate it at, at some point, right? Like maybe I want to find uh, the rate of change of f at the point where s t, how about s t u equals 1, 2, 3. So then that will be um, cosine of 1 times 2 plus 1 plus 2 times 3 squared times 2. Is that 2? Yeah. Plus 2 times 1 plus 2 times 3 times 1 times 2. So what do I get? 2 cosine of 2, what is that? 49 plus 98 plus 28. Any questions? No? That made total perfect sense. Really? This is too easy for you, you say? Go faster? Gee, wow. Up. Um, I, you know what? Why don't you watch the video at 1.5 times speed? Nay, two times. Watch it at 2x if I'm going too slow. <laughs> um, I, I should probably do another example at this point, but I'm not going to just in the interests of time, but check out example five in the text. It's a good one.
it's actually useful and applicable. It's where like you got f of x and y, x and y both depend on r and theta via the usual polar coordinate substitution. And you can find partial f partial r or df d theta in terms of x and y and the partial derivatives of f with respect to x and y. So yeah, maybe I'll, I'll talk about that one in class. All right, moving on to something different but related. Implicit differentiation. So you first saw implicit differentiation back in section 3.8 in the textbook in the one variable case, where, let, re let me remind you what it was. It's where you had some relationship between two variables x and y, but you couldn't explicitly solve for y as a function of x. Nevertheless, by just taking derivatives of everything, you could still solve for the derivative of y with respect to x. And you may not have realized it at the time, but that was actually a preview of taking partial derivatives. So now, more generally, let's suppose that we have an implicit relationship between x, y, and z. That is to say, um, we have an equation of some function of x, y, and z being zero. This is an implicit relationship because we're not explicitly solving for z as some function of x and y. Nevertheless, we can still find the partial derivatives of z with respect to y via implicit differentiation, which I will now show you. So here's how you do it. You start with the equation relating x, y, and z, which is that some function of x, y, and z is 0. Next, I'm going to start taking partial derivatives. And this step is a little bit tricky, so see if you can follow along. Um, the partial derivative of the left-hand side with respect to x is the same as the partial derivative of the right-hand side with respect to x, but that's just zero, okay? That's, it's a derivative of a constant, so it's zero. On the left-hand side, however, we will get, let's see, that'll be a df dx, and I'm going, in order to do this computation, here's what I'm going to assume. I am going to treat z as a function of x and y. Okay, so x is just equal to x. It, it's its own function of itself, dx dx. Y does not depend on x. So the, the partial f partial y dy dx term, that's just 0. Uh, dx dx is equal to 1, by the way. And then finally, for df dz, chain rule says I should follow that up by dz dx. That's what I'm trying to solve for, ultimately. So. This is all equal to 0, because that was on the right-hand side, which means I can solve for the term I'm interested in for dz dx. So dz dx is equal to negative partial f partial x divided by um, partial f partial z. Or how about I, I write that as negative f sub x over f sub z. Cool. So there's my formula for, I uh, know it's a good formula. So. And similarly, I could solve for dz dy. So I would similarly get that dz dy is negative f sub y over f sub z. So how about 
the implicitly defined relationship x squared plus xy plus 2y squared minus z squared minus 2z minus 1 equals 0. The solutions to this look like a hyperboloid. And I'm treating this as my function of x, y, and z. Then let's find partial z, partial x, and partial z, partial y. So fx will equal 2x plus y. fy will equal um, x plus 4y. And fz will equal negative 2z minus 2. Then according to the formula which we just derived, dz dx will equal negative 2x plus y over negative 2z minus 2, or 2x plus y over 2z plus 2. And similarly, dz dy will equal negative x plus 4y over negative 2z minus 2. OK, so that's fine. That's great. How about let's now evaluate this at a particular point on the surface. So because I worked this example out in advance, I already chose a point. So let's consider the point 1, 1, 1. And let's find these partials at that point. So for first, uh, you should check, if you don't believe me, that the point 1, 1, 1 does indeed lie on this surface, right? So plug in 1 for x, 1 for y, and 1 for z. I'm, I'm a little bit hurt that you don't believe me that it's on the surface, but OK. Uh, I'll assume that you've now checked that that point is on the surface. And then let's find dz dx at this point. So at. Uh, the point 1, 1, 1, we have that dz dx will be, I guess that's 3 over 4, and dz dy is 5 over 4. Wow, amazing. We figured out what the partial derivatives were without even having to solve for z. So yeah, that's the sort of um, amazing part about implicit differentiation. And in case you were wondering, by the way, like what this surface even looks like, I, I didn't really bother to graph it, but I think it looks something like a hyperboloid that's opening up in the uh, in the z direction. So it's like two bowls, one bowl opening up and one bowl opening down. You can see that you would have no choice of solving for z as a function of y because it would fail the vertical line test. But nevertheless, at say the point 1, 1, 1, which is right about here, we were still able to find the partials with respect to x and y. And, and then like we could also, for example, find the equation of the tangent plane there. Um, we learned how to do that in the last section. So uh, one last point about implicit differentiation. When you want to find the partials of z with respect to x and y, the function z of x and y needs to at least exist in theory. Like maybe you can't find an explicit formula for it, but um, the so-called implicit function theorem in advanced calculus will guarantee that it exists in theory as long as partial f partial z is not equal to zero at this point. Uh, I can give you examples of where 
it does not exist. Like for example, if you looked at a cylinder described by, um, let's say x squared plus y squared equal to one, it, which does not even depend on z, then you would have no chance of solving for z as a function of x and y uh, at any point on this surface. Right, the function doesn't even depend on z, so certainly this derivative would be zero at every point. But as long as it's not, then you're guaranteed that uh, it is possible to find partial derivatives with respect with respect to the other two variables. Okay, cool. Well, that's the end of it. Um, that was that was the chain rule. All right, cool. Done. Out. Over and out.